Hey, what's up? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. We got an Olympian in the house. Hey. Colleen Quigley is here with us. How's it going? <laughs> Great to see you. Thanks for having me. You got it. Good to have you back in New York as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be here. What's it like running in New York? What's it like training oh, in New man, York? man. Running in New York is the best. On Sunday I did. I had a long run, 14 milers. I'm staying downtown, so ran two miles to the edge of the park, up through the Jackie O Reservoir a few mm. times, um, just around the bridal path and stuff, and then back down. And I think I got a few, hey, Colleen, hey, Steve Will Squigs, while mm. I was running in the morning, everyone's out. You know, it's Sunday morning, everyone's getting their run in, and it's just, ugh, it's vibes out there. It was actually sunny before it, it started, uh, like, sleeting before rain. The, yeah, before <laughs> the hail, right, and the snow and all that. But yeah, I love it. Everyone's super active in the city. I get, like, really competitive with people on that loop around Central Park. You're um, eyeing people. <laughs> it's, like, scalping for sure. Um, but, no, it's just a super active city, and it always makes me, I was probably just, like, grinning from ear to ear like a goofball the whole time I was They're running. like, who is this one? Like, oh, she looks super she's happy. She's an Olympian? Okay, cool. <laughs> but how, yeah, it's a great does, city for running. How does Central Park stack up with some of the other places you've run? Like, you've uh, been all over the world. I know. So, like, where do it's you put this? It's pretty high. The like, the Jackie O Reservoir Loop is one of my favorite all time, like, top three, probably. Um, the other favorite of mine, for sure, is a place that we go to in Switzerland in the mm. summer for some altitude training in St. Moritz, Switzerland. Um, in the wintertime, it's covered in snow and it's a skier's uh. paradise. But in the summer, it's a runner's paradise. Or if you're a cyclist, probably great for that, too. Um, just all these lakes and kind of like that smooth gravel paths that weave around the lakes. Mm. You have views of the mountains. This, the mountains still have snow on the top, so you're oh, like really cool. in a sports bra and shorts, but you can <laughs> like see the snow up there, and you're like, it's just, it's beautiful. That's yeah. awesome. So what has been the wildest part of this whole journey? Because it's like you go from modeling to being an All-American to yeah. college to being an Olympian. Like when you think about the, the totality <laughs> of it, what boggles your mind the most about it? God, um, yeah, it is really wild just because I never like dreamed this for myself. I have some teammates who were like, they made the Olympic team and, you know, they, I heard them saying in interviews and talking about like, oh, I've, I've been dreaming about this since I was a little girl. Mm. And I was like, that really got me thinking like, wow, you were like, yeah. I was not, <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> definitely not. I was dancing and playing soccer and I loved like being active and using my body and being athletic. I've su always been super competitive, um, an older brother. And so just been super competitive my whole life, but I never dreamed of, I never dreamed of running at all, and I never dreamed of representing my country, you know, at the Olympic Games. Um, and so just taking it every step as I go and kind of finding the next challenge and the next challenge, and I meet that goal and I make another goal, a bigger goal, and all of a sudden my goal is to go to the Olympic Games, and now my goal is to get a medal at the Olympic Games. And it's like, yeah, just finding um, new challenges along the way and seeing, like, where that takes me has been really incredible. So I think being competitive is certainly a yeah. defining attribute. What are some of the other things? Because, like, I told you my wife's an athlete. It's like she talks about, like, you have to be, like, a little crazy, too, oh, with some of the things sure. you have to do. So what are your characteristics <laughs> that have really defined your path along the way? If anybody knows runners, you know we're all a little bit crazy. <laughs> 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 little little screw loose, right? Yeah. <laughs> distance runners, especially. Especially distance runners, yeah. Yeah, a little bit crazy. Um, I think just finding a passion for something that you truly enjoy and, like, it's work. Like I ran, I met up with a couple of friends uh, this morning. My alarm goes off at 6 a.m. and I got to get my run in before my first, you know, nine o'clock mm -hmm. appointment this morning. Um, and so, yeah, the alarm goes off and I'm like, ah. but once I get out there and we're chatting and all of a sudden we've run for an hour and, you know, eight miles goes by and you're like, that was such a great way to start my day. I'm still so passionate about mm -hmm. this and I still have so much fun on that day to day like runs and workouts and um, being part of this team, the Barman Track Club is so fun. And I think the moment that you lose that passion or that sense of joy and um, play, then like I'm gonna know. go play yeah. running. Right. Then it's just, as soon as it feels like a job and work and like a chore and you hate it, I mean like some days it feels like a chore. Sure. But as soon as you lose that like overall sense of joy in it, I think that's when it like starts to go downhill. So I think that's a good attribute to just continue to have fun with what you're, you know, passionate about. So how'd you get in the Bowerman Track Club? What's the backstory? There? <laughs> yeah, I graduated um, from Florida State in 2015. Go Knowles. <laughs> you loved college. <laughs> you had a great time at FSU yeah. from what you've said in the past, which is awesome. I loved, I was part of great, this yeah. group of amazing women who, like, going from high school, I was definitely the most into running in my high school, mm. you know? Like, I took it the most seriously. You didn't really have anybody else anyone the same else. way no, like, no, They're no, like, no, okay, Colleen, yeah, you get it. I was it. like, I'm not, you know, drinking on the weekends. Right, I'm right. not staying out late. I'm like, I'm pretty serious. But I want to go to state meet. I won a state title. 
Um, but I went got to college and like I was like a bunch of people who were just like me. That's awesome. And that wanted it just as bad and were doing things that I wanted to do. And so I was following in their footsteps and like that's an incredible thing. And I actually had the same experience when I turned pro too. Like women who were it's the next level of seriousness, you know, where you're like now I'm. Uh, when I when I got kind of the invite to join the Barman Truck Club, it was like these are the women are already doing what I want to do. They've already been to the Olympics. They're training at a super high level. Their level of um, just intensity uh, for what they're doing is just dialed up even more. And so I was like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I need to be doing next. Um, and the coach there too is just an incredible um, coach for, um, especially for the steeplechase, which is, yeah, my specialty. Yeah, the steeplechase is super intense <laughs> yeah. for people that have checked it out. So when did that become <laughs> your specialty? Um, in college, actually, my freshman year, my coach recruited me as a senior in high school. She said, um, I want you to come to Florida State, uh, run for me, I'm going to give you a full ride, and I want you to run the steeplechase. Had you done it before? Never. never. I never jumped over a hurdle. So in high school, um, you do, typically you would do like the 300 meter hurdle, right. like the 100 hurdles, but the 300 hurdles is like the longest right, a little bit longer. hurdling yeah. distance you can do. I never jumped over a hurdle <laughs> in my life. I have long legs. Well, you have the body type Yeah, for and that, I think for sure. just years of dancing and playing mm -hmm. soccer, just that sense of like that athleticism and maybe like spatial awareness. Sure. Um, I see a lot of younger kids now who start running track at like age seven um, and just are like running, you know, running straight, turning left um, for just many, many years. And then they just lose that ability to um, be more dynamic, you know, jump over a stationary object that does not move right. if you accidentally hit it. And there's a body of water right, right there. Right, and there's yeah. water and there's other people jumping in front of you and it's just like hectic. You have to be kind of like super aware on your, you know, on your toes the whole time. Um, so I think, yeah, all those years of dance and soccer really helped me prepare for something that I never knew I was preparing <laughs> for around those years. Do you think the modeling thing also <laughs> helped you in certain ways? I, I think it did. I think the travel thing really helped, like um, traveling for um, photo shoots all over the right. country and all over the world. Like a maturity standpoint? Was or just that life was never life something I would have done. Both my parents were like um, teachers. Mm -hmm. My mom runs a Kumon Center. Um, which is like an after school learning program. Nice. And my dad teaches and coaches um, at a high school in St. Louis where I'm from. And so, yeah, we had amazing family vacations, but we were like taking the camper to Colorado and right, camping in the woods for two weeks. Yeah. Like we weren't, as a model, I was going to like Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas and Paris and Just London. Insane like insane spots. Crazy, yeah. st <laughs> crazy stuff. I never like would have thought that I could ever would have done. And, um, and then becoming like comfortable doing that too. Like comfortable getting on a plane, comfortable getting to a new city and getting a map like this was before like you just look it up on your phone right, like we're gonna like paper maps like <laughs> I'm with my parents we're trying to figure out where the next casting is and and so now when I travel for running I think there's just like that extra level of comfort being in a foreign place where I'm like we'll figure it out like whatever I mean I have literally now it's the easiest thing I have this phone it'll tell you me everything, everything I need to know yeah. <laughs> um, whereas like I feel definitely feel like some of my teammates when they first got out of college and were on the pro circuit for the first couple years um, didn't maybe feel so comfortable like doing that travel stuff and living out of a suitcase yeah. for like six months out of the year it's not easy. can be tough yeah um, so I think that gave me a little bit of like just background experience before I jumped into it it's definitely different but a lot of the things like oh you went to Paris when I was modeling, it was like, yeah, I was on the plane, and I got into a cab, and then went to the hotel, and then went to the shoot all day, and then maybe went out to dinner, and mm. then got back, you know, on the plane and came home. I didn't, like, really see Paris. You didn't get to sightsee at all. I mean, yeah. a little, but sometimes, right. sometimes we would take an extra day, but usually I had to get back for right, school. I was in yeah, high school. school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to get that <laughs> uniform back on and go back to class. Um, and now it's like, yeah, we're on the circuit and you go and fly into a new city and you are you know you can't be like walking around the city for hours before you go compete against the best athletes in the world you have to sit in your butt in the hotel and yeah. rest and prepare for your event and then afterwards you probably have another meet coming up in a week so it's the same thing maybe you go get a nice meal or go see the eiffel tower and then it's like yeah you got to get back on to the next gotta thing. Gotta get right into it. Yeah. So what was most surprising about the pro circuit when you were first starting out? Hmm, most surprising? Um, I think I have had a lot of fun meeting people from different events and like meeting the throwers and the jumpers and the sprinters. Like for example, the throw the throwers are massive, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're these big dudes and, and really strong, crazy strong women who um, are kind of intimidating when you look at them on the outside. You're like, oh my gosh, like, looks like a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. But then you're like at the dining halls or um, in the hotel, they'll you know set up like meals for us. And I'll, I'll be on the circuit sometimes with just myself or maybe my teammates are there, but they're somewhere else. And I end up like, who am I gonna sit with? Mm -hmm. Like 
go sit with the throwers. They just are jump right in there. the best, like just the kindest, gentle giants, like sweetest, funniest. They're always pulling pranks on each other, like just being goofy. Um, yeah, they're like just the best people. And I, I've been surprised about how easy it is to just make friends with people that you've never, you know, never met before. And maybe you've seen compete. Maybe they're like kind of, you know, in the track world, kind of famous, um, but super approachable and just super easy to, you know shoot the shit with that's awesome yeah so you didn't grow up expecting to be a professional runner you qualify mm. for the olympics you've had some time removed from it now so when you think about qualifying like what still sticks out in your memory all these years later oh when i qualified in 2016 yeah. i yeah i definitely hold on to that memory um very closely there it was a hard year coming up to the trials i graduated in 2015 so i had one year as a pro before the trials that summer in 2016 and I spent the majority of that year injured. Um, I joined a new club, I moved to Portland, Oregon, where my track club trains and where Nike's headquarters is and stuff. So I have a new coach and new teammates and a new apartment. Um, I was living out of an Airbnb for a while. Wow. I've like, found a place, big transition time. Um, and I just like kept getting injured and couldn't figure out like how to get healthy that year. And so, yeah, definitely lots of like teary phone calls to my parents being like, did I make the right choice? Like. You know, this is not going really the way I hoped. I'm running out of time before the trials to try and figure it out. Um, but then things kind of turned around a couple months, like maybe three months before the trials. I was finally able to get healthy. Um, when I had a great training camp with my teammates who have the whole time have been super supportive and just like trying to help me as best as I can and help my body figure out what's going on. So I think just it was a struggle, but then by the time I got to the trials, my body was actually feeling good. And I remember just getting to the starting line feeling like, here I am, like no matter what happens, happens. My parents and my brother all dreamed of one day, they were runners too, mm -hmm. and they had dreamed of one day competing at the Olympic trials. Just like you have to qualify to qualify. You right. have to qualify for the trials and none of them ever did, but they wanted to. And so I was like, here I am, I'm doing what like my family had dreamed of for so long, like no matter what happens, um, I'm just gonna give it my best today and like, we'll, you know, like we'll see. And so I went into it with that like sense of calm and just excitement and gratitude for being there and being healthy. Um, and it was a hard race, but when I finished and I grabbed, they give you like this little like mini American flag mm -hmm. for the top three. And I would just like grab that flag and like wave the heck out of it. I was just so happy and just couldn't believe that like all those pieces from a hard year had come together on the day. Um, Cause it's really, it's just one day. Yeah. You make it or you don't, right. and then you if you don't, out. you have yeah. four more years right. to try again. Yeah. So yeah, I always hold on to that as like a super special memory, no matter what happens in 2020 or whatever. Totally. A couple of really interesting parts of that is like you have this really crazy journey up to that process, all the injuries, like yeah. just life stuff, and then like your family, like they'd all been runners. You were probably yeah. the last person that was expected to be in that spot from totally. your family, and yet there you are. So like yeah. all those things coming together, it's it's funny how life works. Sometimes totally, like and they were all there, which was amazing at Hayward Field at uh, mm -hmm. University of Oregon where they held the trials. So we'll have them there again for 2020. So like super historic um, track and just town that they uh, love track there. And so at the end of, they have a tradition if, if you um, qualify, the top three get to take a victory lap around oh, wow. the outside of the track, around lane eight of the track. And the fans are just like all on the fence and in the stands and taking selfies and you're signing autographs to make you feel like such a celebrity. You must have had chills It at was that point. crazy. And then I finally got to like the 200 meter mark halfway around the track mm -hmm. where my parents had tickets and they were sitting and they were like losing it. And we all, like my mom's crying. I started crying and it was just like a super emotional, like just happy. I can't like yeah like can't believe Amazing. this is like real life. Totally. Yeah. All right. No. So you get to Brazil. Yes. There's the whole Zika conversation going yeah. on in 2016. Then you get to the race. There's always some crazy There's thing around the Olympics. Right? Now they're talking about oh we don't we have 50 percent of the housing that we need in Tokyo available. It's like they always blow up right. some kind can of we like, like crazy thing. It's like one year thing. can we just have it finally Come set up? On. It's like please for once. <laughs> it ended up being fine though. The Zika thing was totally not a big deal. No, it was, it was totally like fine. yeah, and they will have housing in Tokyo. Yes, everything it's works be. itself out. <laughs> and then like LA people are like, how are they gonna do it in LA? It's like they did it before the they did, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
So anyway, with the race, you finish in eighth, which even still yeah. finishing in the top ten yeah. is something to be proud of. But for sure. you want to get a medal. So when you think about that race, what didn't go your way that day? Because yeah. like you said, it's one race, it's one, one day. day, and you have to think about it four years later. Yeah. So <laughs> what didn't go your way that day? Yeah, um, so I was like kind of a, definitely a still newbie pro at that point. Um, I had raced the, the year before, the summer before, at World Champs in Beijing. And that was my first like international racing experience. So Rio was my second. I had that little experience under my belt. But now, you know, four years later, I've raced against these women so many more times since then from, you know, many international competitions. Um, I've learned so much about myself and my racing style and my body and my training and what works for me and what doesn't. Um, and just been way more open to you know, peeking under every rug and every cranny and looking at all, like every little thing that I can do to make myself um, the best athlete possible from, you know, now I'm talking to a sports psych and mm. I have a couple of different dietitians that I talk with. Um, I studied dietetics in school, so that's kind of like definitely a passion of mine, but, you know, talking to professionals who knew, know way more than I do about um, the latest, you know, stuff that I need to be thinking about. Um, yeah, working with my coach for another four years who is really good at building strength in athletes, like really focused on that aerobic endurance side that just takes years to develop. Yeah. Um, so working, you know, working on that, working on my hurdles, just all those little components that take time, but, um, and, you know, perfecting, but I think hopefully can come together, um, on a great day as long as I can stay healthy and, um, come into the race with a good mindset about like, you know. Let's make the most of this day as we possibly can. Then, yeah, hopefully great things can happen. Totally. What have those sports psych conversations been like so far? Super interesting. The latest thing that uh, we've been talking about, like this summer I was feeling a lot of anxiety going into world champs mm. um, because the last world champs I got disqualified in the prelim. I made, a, I made a mistake and I stepped half of my foot onto half of the white line after the water pit on one of the, uh, one of the water pits in the prelim. And the, it was in London, and the London officials are extremely yep. strict. <laughs> um, and even though everyone was like, oh, come on, you know, they were like, the rules are the rules. And it's like, yeah, the rules are the rules. But I got disqualified, um, and two of my Team USA teammates won and got second. They went one, two. And my event, which was ne has never been done before, it was incredible. Um, but I was watching from the stands, and it was super mm. kind of traumatic for me. Um, so then I was hoping to come back for the next world champs and like really like prove myself But I was putting all this pressure on myself to do that and like I really wanted to Prove myself and say like if I had been in the race, I, you know, I would have been up there, too um, And so talking to my sports psych about how I was like almost starting to dread going into worlds because I wanted it to go well so badly right. And so we started focusing on forgetting about the result and just trying to put away like the thought of getting on the podium and stuff and instead focusing on what I can control, which is how do I race my best? And we talked a lot about that and we figured out that getting in my flow state mm -hmm. helps me race. That's when I race my best is when I feel like I'm in a state of flow where I'm not like just forcing it. I'm not like trying too hard. I'm not like relaxed and jogging, but like everything feels smooth. I feel calm. Like I can keep my heart rate down. Um, and I'm not, I'm not pressing. I'm not tight. You know, I'm not like going crazy up here. And so working on like little tips and tricks for me, like what works for me to help get me into that, that flow so that I can step on the starting line, feeling calm and relaxed and just ready to execute um, the ideal race plan for, for me and for that day. Yeah, I think it's really cool that we live in a world now where it's like you can talk about this with your sports yeah. psych. Like we can have these conversations here on totally. camera. Like even with Mary Kane, like we were talking off camera. Yeah. Like that's one of the biggest stories in sports of the year in my opinion. Amazing, it's like, yeah. Listen, her experience was really rough and difficult, but like anxiety is a huge issue, depression, totally. body image. Like thankfully you've had a great group of women, but yeah. what was your reaction when you heard about Mary Kane's story? Yeah, I was like on a panel last night um, talking about some of that stuff and we were talking about like normalizing, um, talking about periods mm -hmm. in sport, for example. Yeah. Like we need, like women, female athletes need to be more open about, hey, it is not normal to lose your period for six months out of the mm -hmm. year. Like that is not okay, that's not normal. That's not a sign that you're in shape or healthy or, um, you know, oh, that means you're really fit. 
it. Like, no, that means you're not eating enough. That means your energy output is not equal to your what you're intaking. Um, and you can do serious damage to your body, mess up your hormones that can take years and years to recover from that might affect you for the rest of your yeah. life. You can get osteoporosis at a young age um, from doing stuff like that. So just making that conversation more open and like, hey, we can talk about this. This is not a taboo subject. Like you can talk, like one woman asked me last night, um, what do you do if you have your period and you're at the Olympics? And I'm like, mm. Yeah, like that's a thing. It, yeah, it happens. Be yeah, yeah, yeah. And so just ta like making it not something that's embarrassing for women or like a weird thing. Like there's male coaches. There's not as many female coaches as, as there should be, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of male coaches who should and can and do talk about that with their athletes, their, the female athletes that they're coaching um, all the time. Like my dad coaches at my old high school mm -hmm. still, um, and he's kind of a. I would say he's kind of like a hippie or, um, yeah, kind of like a granola dad. But, <laughs> yeah. but he talks about that with his height. It's a really important thing, especially um, for high school girls, to, to realize that that's not a normal thing, to be like, oh, yeah, I haven't gotten my period yet. I'm mm. 16. It's like, well, we need to talk about that. Yeah, and to create an environment where it is comfortable to talk yeah, about. Yeah, where they feel comfortable. Right, because there's some situations where it's like a young woman, a, a man who just doesn't have the awareness, yeah. and you're just keeping it in. And totally. you really suppress it, and that's an issue. But now that we're having more conversations about it, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, everybody's kind of going through something similar. Yeah. And we can actually just kind of figure things out here. I love that. I love, like, I talk about injuries a lot, mm -hmm. too. If I'm going through an injury, I'm, like, super open and honest about it on my social media. And I feel like that's the same thing where people are, like, don't want to admit it. They feel right. embarrassed if they get injured. They feel like something's wrong with them. Like, they're damaged goods, and they don't want to share. But honestly, like the moment I share about an injury, like, hey, I'm going through an injury, like this is happening, yeah. I feel like a weight's lifted. I'm like, that's real life. Like, yeah. I don't have to keep this secret anymore. Right. Like, and it feels so much better, and I, I don't feel like um, ashamed about it. I'm just sharing about. It. And then so many people respond to me and be like, me too, right. and like, oh, I've dealt with that before. This is what I tried. Have you tried this? And all of a sudden, it's like opened up a conversation that um, is like beneficial and healthy and healing especially on social media where most yeah. of the time you're not seeing reality so totally. it's super refreshing when that happens yeah too. i know it's hard I, sometimes i see like my competitors and stuff and they'll come up, like they'll be posting all these like running photos and <laughs> and then they'll come out and be like oh, i've just been injured like big injury i'm like didn't look like it yeah, it's like, yeah but your last post was a little different <laughs> so yeah i try and do my best to like just be real about like hey it's not it's not perfect every day, but that makes the good moments. That makes the moments when you get to sure. stand there at the finish line with the flag, um, being like, I just made a you know huge PR or whatever it is. If it's, I ran my first marathon, like, yeah, that makes that moment so much sweeter when you know what you had to go through to, to get there. Totally, so you're obviously focused on 2020 with the Olympics. Yes. What are some little goals for you along the way you're looking to hit? Yeah, you gotta have nuggets. Yeah, um, let's for start sure. with the small ones. Obviously <laughs> we know the big ones, but you're, yes. you're somebody that has goals, so what are you yeah. focused on right now? Yeah, it's an Olympic year, so obviously I um, wanna go to Tokyo and represent Team USA as best as I can. Um, before that, we do have an indoor season. So um, for, for pro track athletes, the fall is kind of like our off season. We get to relax a little bit, to, you know, take some time to just be a little bit more family oriented mm, and all that stuff. Nice. Um, but then January 1st, we head back up to our first training camp. Uh, my team's going to Colorado Springs. There's an Olympic training center there. We'll be there for about a month before um, some indoor track races. Um, actually doing a race here in New York probably um, in February. Don't have my, my schedule completely set, but there's a really great race here in February um, called the Milrose Games. So I'm hoping to be able to be healthy and compete there. Um, we have an indoor world, or, sorry, indoor U.S. championships mm -hmm. this year, and there's actually an indoor worlds um, this year as well. And then a few big outdoor meets, like the Prefontaine Classic will be at Hayward Field. Um, in um, Oregon, and then the U.S. trials are in June, also at Hayward Field. So we got some, yeah, got, got some big races for sure coming up, and lots of training camps um, in there. My team goes to, we'll go to Colorado Springs, and then we do some a lot of training in Park City, um, Utah, in the summertime too. So um, lots of time away from home, just focused on like eating well, running a lot, sleeping well, recovering well. Uh, I'm trying to be that like ideal athlete. Yeah, it's a full-time job. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. People don't realize that, no, but it is. It, it really is. 100% is. <laughs> Just taking care of your body. Yeah. It's something you really need to invest yeah. in. Yeah, and then, you know, if you're someone like me, I have a website and a newsletter, and I try and, you know, do as much of that interaction mm -hmm. with followers uh, as I can and sharing nuggets of the journey, recording a workout that I do in the gym or whatever. 
along the way too. So if I'm on my bed with my feet up, <laughs> relaxing, I'm on my laptop, you're like working. you're working on my <laughs> <laughs> on my website. <laughs> Good deal, Colleen. Really nice to meet so you. So great to meet Thanks you. For Thanks for the in. time. All right, everybody, for Colleen, I'm DJ. See you next time. Here, <laughs> Thank I'll sit you. down. <laughs>